<laughs> uh, all right, so uh, I am Danny. Uh, we'll go ahead and introduce everybody real quick. Um, it's going to be on the call for HERDA. Uh, Amber Falls is our communications manager. Uh, then we'll have Julia Castillo. She's our executive director, followed by myself, and then Brooke Ramsey, our business manager. Um, so Amber's up first, and go ahead, Amber, take it away. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Amber Falls. I'm the communications manager here at HERDA, overseeing our scheduling and dispatching. I'm just going to do a brief overview of our scheduling software, VIA. Uh, we transitioned over to VIA mid-September, so we've had the software for about uh, seven months now. Let's see here. All right. Currently, there are three ways to schedule. Um, writers can call our toll-free number, uh, email our team, uh, and also use the HERDA On Demand app to schedule their trips directly. So a couple of the features that the VIA software provides uh, would be automated scheduling uh, when, when our staff or a writer submits a request. Uh, the system will look at all available routes for that particular day and time and uh, will we'll automatically look and find an available space for that request. Uh, if there is no availability uh, at that point, the writer can adjust a, a time or day to look for other available times. Uh, the system does monitor the schedules throughout the day as well. So if uh, it sees that there's a particular route that might be running behind, and it, it finds there is the ability to adjust some trips or reassign them to another driver, it will do so. Uh, the system does also provide uh, customizable notifications. Currently, we have two specific notifications that uh, one provides either a voice or SMS notification the day before the scheduled ride, as well as providing a notification when the driver is approximately uh, five minutes away from that rider's pickup. Uh, of course, again, riders do have uh, availability to schedule directly through the HERDA On Demand application. Um, that does allow, uh, allow a rider to schedule a same day or future request. Uh, we do also have a web application, uh, which we're expecting to be available mid next month. Uh, so those that uh, don't have a smartphone or, or maybe don't want to download that app will still have that uh, direct access to submit a request uh, directly uh, from a browser. Uh, we are also looking to have a paratransit app available for the um, paratransit riders in the Story County area, uh, hopefully uh, shortly, uh, shortly after that mid-May timeframe as well. So just a brief overview, um, in the VIA system, we have a, a very simple uh, customer management system where our, our team is able to uh, pull up information on a particular writer, any general information as far as name, address, phone number, uh, uh, potential account balance they may have, uh, future and upcoming trips. Uh, we do also have the ability to uh, text writers, uh, writers that have uh, activated that SMS feature. So again, it will provide those notifications. We can also um, provide ad hoc notifications if needed to, to text a writer uh, if, if we have need to do so. When we receive a request through phone or email, um, our team simply needs to pull up that writer account and click this, uh, click request a ride so that we can go ahead and pull up a screen to begin entering that, that trip data. Let's see here, there we go. So um, the screen will just pull up a, a, a page for us to go ahead and enter the necessary trip data. Uh, of course, we can enter an immediate request uh, for now or later if it's a future request. 
uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and enter the requested pickup, which we can use either a physical address or a, or a business name. If a writer is wanting to go to Walmart or they have a specific address, we can use either. Uh, we do have the ability of setting favorites if there's a particular location that the writer goes to on a regular basis. Uh, if it's going to be a round trip or if it's a reoccurring, for instance, the writer takes his trip every Monday, we'll be able to enter that information. Uh, enter a, a trip day and a time frame, what they're, uh, how they're going to pay for the trip, and then we can simply submit uh, this get proposal option. And the system is going to, on an automated basis, go ahead and look through the available routes for that particular day and time, and then come back and provide, uh, provide to us what options are available. There we go. So here we can see in this particular uh, option, there were two choices available. So we can pick either one of these options, go ahead and select the choice that we would like, book the ride, and everything will be all set for that rider. Um, it does, of course, also provide what that fare is going to be. And then very, uh, very similar to our internal process for those that are using the Herda On Demand app, uh, the writer can simply pull that application up and start entering their trip information. Uh, the system does automatically initially look at their current uh, GPS location. Uh, so it will populate the, the exact location that the writer is at. Uh, however, they do have the ability of entering a, a, a secondary location if that's what they'd like to do. Uh, again, enter the location that they're looking to go to. Uh, any additional information, if there are any special instructions regarding the pickup or drop off location, uh, the writer has the ability of, of entering that information. And then again, clicking to, to book the ride and seeing what options are available for them. And um, once it's gone through the system, it's going to pull up. In this case, an option was available in 20 minutes for the rider, uh, again, providing that fare uh, so, that, so the rider knows how much is expected for the trip. Uh, if they're looking, initially, this system does look at uh, an immediate time frame. It was originally built on, for an on-demand basis. So if, if the rider is looking for a future date, all they'll need to do is click the schedule option here down below and enter the uh, future date and time that they're looking to schedule the trip for, uh, process that through the system again. And then once they, once a, a option comes up, they can go ahead and click the book, book that trip. Uh, if a return is needed, there's an option to go ahead and book that return. And, um, from there, writers do have the ability of seeing any future schedules, uh, so they can see that either through a calendar option or list option, um, so that they're able to manage any upcoming trips. There is the ability of uh, canceling or adjusting those, those future trips if needed as well. And then uh, again, on an internal basis, our, uh, this is a, a screenshot of, of a um, sy system portion that our team is able to see. Uh, this allows us just to have an eye on the day-to-day -day, um, operations, what's going on on each individual route in a, a quick, easy to see uh, system. Uh, we're able to, uh, through these color coding, see um, if everything's running on time, everything that's in green is, is within its window, so we know everything's all good. Uh, when we start seeing a yellow or red, that's telling us something's starting to run a little bit behind. So again, that automated system, if there is an option um, for the system to move a trip uh, so that we're able to get things back on track, it will do so. Uh, with this particular image. Uh, obviously, sometimes if the schedules are really tight, there may not be an option. So it does allow us to quickly see if there are any potential routing issues so that we can reach out and communicate to riders if, if something is gonna run a little bit behind on that particular day. 
All right, and that's a quick overview. Any questions for me? All right, well, if anyone does think of anything, uh, my contact information is on screen. You're more than welcome to reach back out and I'm more than happy to answer any other questions you might have. Amber, did you check the chat? There was something put in there real quick. Oh, thank you. I did not catch that. Well, that was just me clarifying about the <laughs> portal also to give people access to um, the Google Translate option so they could, um, it'll be available to people in over 99 languages. That was actually done. Danny, are you gonna talk about that later? Um, I can briefly. Um, so we, uh, through one of the grants that we're working with um, through NADTC, um, we actually were able to purchase this web portal um, because this, the app is available in English and Spanish. Um, and through this web portal, um, it allows them to access it, it over in over 99 languages. Um, so it's kind of exciting um, for us to be able to um, offer that as um, to more of our writers. All righty. Thank you, Amber. Thanks, everyone. All right. Up next, we have Julia Castillo, our executive director. Danny, you're going to run my slide. Hi everyone, um, my name is Julia Castillo and I'm the executive director at HERDA. And I'm just going to talk about a couple of things that HERDA is doing um, on climate change. Um, you hear a lot about climate change in the urban areas, but you don't hear a lot about it in the more rural areas and we need to do um, our part as well. So as you can see, the United States has set an economic economy-wide target of reducing its um, greenhouse gas emissions by 50% or below um, the 2005 levels by the year of 2030. Um, the current administration is encouraging all transit systems to be 100% electric by the year 2050, but as you heard Scott talk about today, the, the probability of that happening is um, very far stretched. So. Um, but you have to start somewhere because this administration has also put more money into um, looking at electric vehicles, not looking at vehicles, purchasing electric vehicles. Um, and so we were awarded um, five electric vehicles and five electric Ford Transits. And um, we just applied for an additional three electric buses and two electric Ford Transits on this last um, round of funding through the Iowa DOT. So we are dipping our toe in to see what this is going to look like. Next slide, please. Um, so HERDA did a climate action plan, and that is on our website if you would like to take a look at that, what it means and what we are actually doing and who we will be working with in the future, because I know a lot of the cities are looking at doing things as well. But um, it does include investing in electric vehicle infrastructure and investing in public charging infrastructure. Um, we do have it in there that we will look a goal is to replace 100% of our fleet with alternative fuels or electric buses by 2050, but that is based on what this administration has requested of us. And we need to decrease fuel costs. Um, and we're hoping that going with different types of vehicles due to the supply chain that we have issues we have right now will also help us get vehicles more quickly as we're replacing old vehicles. Next slide. Um, this is just a picture of what our current vehicles would look like for a Ford Transit and what an e-Transit would look like without our graphics on it. You can see you're not going to notice a lot of difference um, in what the product actually looks like. It's all going to be in how it operates and the cost savings that it's going to um, supply, hopefully, to HERDA and also uh, being better for the environment the next and this is one of our buses. 
um, versus what one of the electric bu buses would look like. So just wanted to make sure that everybody knew the buses are going to pretty much look the same um, if we stay with the same type of vehicle. Next slide. Um, something else that's very exciting for HERDA is we are the one transit system um, in the state of Iowa that does not own any of our own uh, facilities. We lease a lot of different buildings um, to house our operations, but we don't have our own facility. So we were awarded um, through the FTA, um, by the FTA through Iowa DOT, money for a administrative and maintenance facility. We are currently in the process of locating property to uh, be able to purchase, to build the facility on. Um, but we've been in business over 40 years, and this is the first time that we will have our own transit facility. So everybody at, at HERDA is super excited about that. Um, and as you can tell, we spend over $100,000 a year just in leasing office spaces um, throughout our region. So that will be $100,000 that we can actually use towards something that we own. Um, we are also applying for additional funding to build um, a couple of indoor bus storage facilities. We just um, applied for one in the Knoxville area. So um, the weather in Iowa is very hard on our vehicles. It uh, lessens the useful life of our vehicles and they do take a beating either in the hot heat or in the cold winter times. So um, we will also be happy to get some of our vehicles stored inside. Next slide. Um, so we wanted to stick with being able to make this facility um, better for the uh, environment. So it will be LEED certified. We want to have uh, recycled rainwater, solar energy, geothermal heating and cooling. Um, and there will be electric charging, uh, not only for our transit fleet, but we're also um, hoping to put uh, electric charging stations in our parking lot um, that the community can also take advantage of. Um, like I said, our goal is to reduce greenhouse gases, you know, it, be, it will be clean energy. Um, we have to do our part in the climate crisis um, that is happening. And um, indoor storage fleet at this facility, there will be some of that. There will also be a large maintenance facility so that we are paying um, um, mechanics of our own to actually do the maintenance on our vehicles, which will be more timely. Um, we will have better oversight of it, and we won't have to pay the prices that we pay um, currently for a third-party provider to do those for us. Next slide. This is just a very rough draft of what the facility will look like. As you can tell, the bigger part that's in the green and the, the light tan, that is all maintenance. Um, there will be a, bu a bus wash bay in there and then several maintenance bays um, so that we can work on uh, more than one vehicle at a time. And then the one in color right attached to the green, that is going to be on the first floor. Um, we are looking at also um, partnering with inner city bus, which would be Jefferson Lines and Burlington Trailway. Um, to be a, a transfer point for them. And then the one over at the side will be the second story of where all of the, the um, offices for HERDA staff um, will be. There will also be a large training room that we will be able to use better to train our staff and our drivers um, and have larger trainings if we want to invite more of the um, other 35 transit systems from around the state of Iowa and to do larger trainings. Um, and we are probably going to look at how we can, uh, you know, be good stewards of our community and allow other people to use that training space if they need to as well. Next slide. And that's what I have to talk about today of what's the exciting things that are happening at HERDA. If anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. 
And if not, you can always uh, email me or give me a call. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Julia. <clears throat> All right. So I'm going to be talking about the Flex Connect program um, that we have going on in Perry. Um, so the Flex Connect. Um, so it was identified um, as a checkpoint style transit service. Um, riders can still do the traditional herd of service um, going the door to door route. Um, but we have a new option um, where it's kind of like the a traditional um, route service where you can hop on these stops uh, around town. And then we can kind of, um, you know, swing by, pick you up, and you can see there. Um, it's got a QR code. It's got the stop time. So the stop um, is the first stop. So eight, nine, ten, and goes till four. Um, but it allows people to, you know, catch a bus at you know designated areas. Um, so we have one at um, High V. We have one um, at a Hispanic market. Um, so it's a good way to access you know, healthcare. Um, we have one at the Dallas County Hospital. Um, so yeah. So why is this needed? <laughs> the Latino population in Iowa is 6.3%, but the Latino population in Perry is 34.9%. Um, and the current the number who currently use HERDA is less than 1%. Um, and through the, our friends at the da Dallas County Health, they identified that transportation was a barrier um, for service or barrier to services for Latinos. Um, and even 50% stated that transportation was a major barrier. So a little bit of the details here. Um, we want to create an educational campaign um, to reduce stigma and exclusion. Um, we, we have created some brochures, some advertisements. We sent a mailer to everyone in Perry um, announcing the service. Um, we've created a video on our Facebook page, um, a lot of social media. Um, I'll be down there next Saturday to do a community event, um, kind of showcasing the service. Um, and what we want to do is we want to connect with new writers, um, specifically Latino, um, but anyone's um, able to write this. Um, and we have a social determinants of health questionnaire for them. Um, so we are collecting those numbers or collecting those responses. Um, our friends at Dallas County Hospital is. Um, we have a couple other community members that are also doing that as well. Um, and basically what happens is they take a survey um, and it just asks, like, you know, if you have any troubles, you know, paying rent, um, access to food, stuff like that. Um, and then if they take the survey, they're given a pass to ride for free uh, for a year. Um, and that's going to be tracked at six months and 12 months. So when they, um, we have one pass for six months, um, at that six month mark, um, we'll have them take the questionnaire again. Um, just make sure you know we're actually helping um, helping them as best we can, um, and then they will get a new card um, at that point. Um, and then, if somebody says yes to you know whether they need healthcare, whether they need help um, paying utility bills, um, we connect them with the Dallas County Health Department, um, and then they take it from there. One of their health navigators takes it from there, uh, and then we also provide that data to them as well. And you can learn more at writeherda.com slash flex, um, but that kind of just gives an overview of, of the program. And that's all for me. If anybody has any questions, you can put it in the chat um, or uh, here in the chat. Um, Brooke said the survey can be done online and is it available in English and Spanish. Um, and Julia said, um, I will help fund the Flex Connect program, um, which we greatly appreciate. She meant Iowa DOT. <laughs> Iowa DOT. <laughs> we also got a grant from ARP, we might have noticed in the pictures, that um, uh, helped to purchase the bus benches as well, the AARP. Yep, bench funded by AARP. Uh, Tim asked, is the Flex Connect general public and what is the pricing for general public? Um, yes, the Flex Connect is available to everyone. Um, and then it is the traditional pricing of $2.50 in town. Or they can complete that questionnaire and write for free for a year. All right, if there's any other questions, feel free to reach out. 
um, or put them in the chat and we will answer them at the end. Otherwise, I will turn it over to Brooke Ramsey. Well, well just to <clears throat> comment on, on Danny's discussion with the social determinants of health, we are going to provide that data that we receive back to the Dallas County Health Department as well. Um, so they can use that in ways that have a more meaningful impact uh, to the entire county. <clears throat> and they've been so gracious to help uh, get people to fill out the information um, and in turn get those bus passes. Okay, so the Herd is Health Connector. I feel like we've been talking There's about another com. I'm sorry, there's another comment, Brooke, um, oh. from Misty. Yeah. Um, Oh, so yeah, the it, it is general public. Anybody can use it. Um, and then Misty, you have flyers for the Flex Connect located at the real estate box outside of the library. That's great. Thank you. Um, so the Herd is Health Connector. I feel like we've been talking about this one for a really long time. Um, it's something I work on every day, so I am super excited for it to kind of wrap up and move forward. But we, back in 2020, we had submitted a proposal. Um, IDI group actually helped with that. Uh, but we submitted a proposal to the US DOT's Joint Program Office for their intelligent transit systems for the United States program. Um, and then our team uh, included CTAA, which you heard from earlier. Um, Dallas County Health Department has been helping us on that project as well. Uh, capture management. They help with all of our marketing and outreach. And then, of course, IDI Group does a variety of different things, including software development um, and systems engineering specific to transportation. So. Uh, so we were awarded that project in, I feel like it took forever to hear back, but we were awarded the project in January of 2021. We were originally one of five sites that they selected. We are the only rural system um, that was selected. Everyone else is in an urbanized area. Then last year, we reapplied for the phase two and phase three. So phase one was essentially developing a lot of technical documentation um, because all of these projects are required to uh, be open sourced so that other transit systems across the country can implement something similar. So we had to do a lot of documentation so that they could um, learn why and how we did what we did. Uh, phase two and phase three are developing the technology. And well, that's phase two. And phase three is actually um, the operation of that. So uh, there's only four of us that were selected to move forward into phase two and phase three. So the health connector um, is to connect health and transportation. Um, so when you schedule your doctor's appointment, you'll be able to schedule your doctor's appointment and your health care at the same time. <clears throat> so while we do provide service in um, a seven county area, those of you who are familiar with Central Iowa will understand we serve over 4,100 square miles. There are, are a lot of different challenges and the different types of communities, not to mention the different health um, networks that exist. Some have a lot and some don't have much. So uh, in Dallas County, the population growth, the uh, unique challenges that Danny just spoke about with um, language barriers um, and working with the documentation that their health department did on their community health plan and um, health assessments, just a lot of different factors came into play. So we selected Dallas County to be the pilot community only because we had to be realistic about what we could, um, you know, how many different healthcare providers we would be able to work with as this pilot. However, with that being said, once we get the technology up and working and make sure that there are no bugs, then um, we will we will operate the service across our whole seven county region. And we hope our peers in, in other parts of Iowa and in other parts of the country um, will implement the same technology as well. So in our outreach efforts, uh, various interviews and focus groups, listening sessions, a lot of groundwork was done. 
And any of you who work with people in the community won't be surprised to know, especially with healthcare and transportation, that there is a lot that goes into helping people. So on the left is kind of the current model of how things are done. Sometimes people walk into a human, um, a human service agency and they need help. Um, sometimes they may qualify for Medicare. Sometimes you know they're dealing with uh, a different agency who might provide funding. In Dallas County's case, their health department has health navigators, which help with a lot of that. Um, and then, the, of course, there's the provider and the transit system. So as it is right now, um, people are going here and there and kind of everywhere. And it's difficult. It's a lot of barriers. It's a lot of steps. There's a lot of opportunities for people to get frustrated or give up or just not know what to do and, and stop trying. So in our model that we're going towards, it's more people centric. So we want the health connector to sit in the middle of all of these different things and simplify the process for people to help reduce missed health appointments and create healthier communities that we serve. So this is just a look at um, the entire process. So not only did we wanna create this technology to allow people to schedule their health and their transportation at the same time, but the trip is really so much more than getting on the bus and your time on the bus. It starts long before that ride happens. It starts when you know you need to schedule that ride. It, then how do you get to the vehicle? Then once you're on the vehicle, what might you need to know? Uh, so we're looking at additional solutions like indoor wayfinding as an example. Um, so those of you who may be familiar with uh, Unity Point downtown, they have the John Stoddard Cancer Center. I, um, if you think about that cancer center, then you could be dropped off at that door. But once you walk inside, even though the name is above the door, you walk inside, that's not actually the cancer center. So then you have to turn down a hallway, you have to find the elevator, find the stairway, um, and, and it's a lot of steps. So we will have a technology available um, that people can use their smartphone if they choose, they can have audio prompts or they can just get the visual prompts on their phone, much like you have mapping um, that you use when you drive your car and you're trying to find somewhere. But this will be indoors to help them find the full way to their medical appointment. So you can still call into the office to schedule a trip, that won't change. Um, you know, Amber kind of walked through what that process looks like, uh, but there will be just some enhanced things that happen along the way. So as I mentioned earlier, um, where we're at is phase two. We're almost a year into it. So we've got about a year left. Um, we have the, the software developers working with not only the um, Access to Care, who is the Iowa's Medicaid uh, broker, um, working to help with them, uh, as well as working with our scheduling um, software via that Amber talked about earlier and with the hospitals. So there's a lot of moving parts and partners, but I feel like we're making some good strides. Um, we do have a one pager of this program. We also have uh, an, a larger four page document if anybody's interested or wants to have that as a resource to give out. Um, that's a little more detailed about the full program for the USDOT and then specifically with our project. And we have a pop-up site that Capture made for us that's transithealthconnector.org where we update that uh, on a regular basis as well. Any questions about it? Well, thank you. All right, if anybody has any questions, um, they can put it in the chat. We'll give just a brief second here. Um, Otherwise, we will go ahead and move into our next subject.